All right, that's what I'm talking on this morning. Okay, I want to talk about the importance of church and uh, reasons why people get out of church. Um, so the purpose of this sermon is to uh, bring these to your attention so that if you see these things creeping up in your life, you can do something about it before you quit. Uh, unfortunately, too many Christians these days quit church. You know, thankfully, you guys haven't. You guys are still here. Um, but let's talk about some of those reasons today. But before I get into that, <clears throat> church is so important to your spiritual life. Don't underestimate how important church is. Some people will say things like, oh, well, can't you just learn the Bible at home? You know, can't you just do things on your own? Yeah, well, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. There's something different about when you come to church, you know, where there's order and there's Bible preaching and there's singing. The Spirit of God is here with us. It's so important in your spiritual life. Look at what it says here in Hebrews 10, verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more <clears throat> as you see the day approaching. You know, the Bible describes the church as the pillar and ground of the truth. You know, that doesn't just, the, also, that means that the church, you know, upholds the truth the, as, as a pillar, but it's also the ground of the truth. Why is it a ground? Because this is where Christians can get planted in and grow as a Christian and become a fruitful tree. You know, some people will think to themselves, well, you know, I can, I can grow. I don't need church to grow spiritually. And, you know, like everyone that I know that has said this has gotten worse in their spiritual life. I mean, show me somebody that's out of church that thinks, oh, I don't need church to grow. And then tell me if there's somebody that's like more or further along in their Christian life or further back in their Christian life. Right? You don't grow because, you know, the Christian that says, you know, I don't need church to grow, or I don't need to be in church, I can still learn. They, it, it's, they might grow a little bit, but then they remind me of like that, the, the plants on my, 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 uh, my wife's uh, windowsill in the kitchen. You know, when you put a plant like in a little cup, and then you put a little bit of water in it, and, and you know, it grows a little bit of leaves and just a little bit of roots, and you're like, ah, see, there's growth. Yeah, but God doesn't want just this little plant on the windowsill that's growing some roots and some leaves. Like, God wants a fruitful tree. And you're not going to be like a fruitful tree if you're just outside, not planted in the ground and put your roots in and get some actual sustenance, right, in terms of growing and serving in a church. So you don't want to deceive yourself. You know, you don't want to kid yourself that you know, church is just something that is optional. We can see here that it's commanded by God and for good reason, right? It's not, God doesn't just command things for no reason at all. He commands things because he knows is critical to our Christian life. You know, that's why sometimes when you don't feel like coming to church, that's when you need church the most, right? To come here and be reminded why you're on this earth, you know, to, to live for God, to preach the gospel, to do things spiritual, do things of eternal value, not just things of temporary value. What are some reasons why Christians quit church? So I'm going to give you, I'm going to go through six things this morning, why some Christians quit church, and none of them are good reasons to quit church. There is no good reason to quit church, right? Because obviously you'd be in disobedience, but let's look at some of those reasons. And I'll, probably, I'll go through them. I've tried to sort them from what I believe to be like most common to least common, right? First one. First one is broken relationships. Broken relationships. Galatians 5. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But... If ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I would say that in my experience, you know, even pastoring this church, that this is probably the reason, the number one reason why people will quit a church. But it also, on the, on the flip side of all these reasons, you can see what encourages people to stay in a church. You know, you can have strong relationships in a church. 
then that encourages people to stay and encourages people to keep coming and, and enjoy coming because you've got you know, friends here and, and learning together and serving together. But when there is personal conflicts, you know, it, it, it can have such a detrimental effect on the church and on people staying in church. Now, is it a good reason for people to quit church? Of course not, right? Like, you know, people expect sometimes they come to church and they think, you know, oh, these are Christians. These people are, you know, should be perfect. These people shouldn't do what you know, the world does. And I agree with you, they shouldn't, but will they? Yeah, they will. And if you're in a church long enough, you'll probably step on somebody's toes or somebody's toes, you know, will step on your toes, you know, because we're just people. And when people spend enough time together, they may get on each other's nerves. This is why love is so important for us to love one another, right? And to try and get along and to be able to forgive and to forbear one another's, um, you know, things that we, we suffer one another, you know, even though you maybe have you know, be wronged and, you know, you may uh, need to learn not to be so offended, right? Because conflict is, is so detrimental to unity and peace. I'm sure, you know, so many uh, marriages break up these days and so many people come from broken families. I come from a broken family. You know, it's, a, it's a terrible thing these days. But for those of you who do have experienced, you know, like a marriage breakup, you know what it's like. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's two people, they don't like each other, and then they're trying to get family on their side, and then they're saying nasty things about the other person, and then sometimes it's like, you know, there's like a wedding, and they can't even be in the same room together, and it's just like these two, everyone has to work, now work around these two people that are like at odds end with each other. And all of us know that happens in, in marriages, when marriages break up, but the exact same thing happens just when, like, any sort of conflict breaks up, you know? So even, like, you know, when two people are dating and then they break up, you know, then now one of them doesn't want to come to church because it's too... So there's all these things that happen, even with, like, say, friendships, you know? Let's say you, 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 somebody's nasty to somebody else and now they've sort of broken that friendship. That same dynamic happens, doesn't it? Where people are like now trying to get each other on their side and say nasty things about the other person. This is why it's so important for us to be mature about how we relate with one another, and how we love one another, and that if we do have conflicts, we don't go and bad mouth the other person and try and get people on our side. And you know, we need to love one another like it says here and be aware of what this does. And oftentimes, when people have personal conflicts, they leave. A church, but we should just have the expectation that you know, no matter where you go, there's going to be personal conflicts. Generally, when you join a group of people and there aren't any conflicts, it's just because you don't know them that well. You know, just that sometimes just shows your level of involvement with that group of people. Because when you are, when you do get involved and you had a vested interest in what the group is trying to accomplish, that's when. You know, sometimes people will clash just personality-wise, or they might say something to one another that isn't so favourable, and then it goes like that. So beware of this. This is a this is a big reason why people get out of church, but it's not a good reason. You know, if anything, as you go through conflict in your life, it's a way to grow because now you have an opportunity to overcome that conflict. Sometimes people, they come across conflict and then they leave. And then they go somewhere else, they have another conflict and then they leave and they leave. They just keep running away from that. You'll never learn to deal with conflict and overcome conflict if you just keep running away from it. So this is why it's important as well to be in church and even though if you have some conflicts, to come back to church and learn to deal with it. Learn to be able to say sorry. Learn to be able to approach somebody and talk with them. Learn to, you know... Put the ball in their court and let you do everything you can to reconcile. That's the sort of attitude we want. And it's a good measure of spiritual maturity, how somebody deals with conflict. But one thing I want to want you to reflect on here is just, you know, conflict is a very detrimental thing to any church and to any organization. James 3, 5, look at this. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. This is the Bible talking about our words and what we speak, like not the, just the tongue organ itself. Obviously, the tongue is representing the words and how we use words and how detrimental they can be, how damaging they can be. 
and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. See, your, your, what you say can be defiling to your whole self, right? And setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So we've got to be aware of that. And unfortunately, you know, when people have broken relationships, you know, they get out of church, but you shouldn't. You know what I mean? Just because you have a conflict with somebody else or even a breakup. You know, this is why sometimes when, uh, you know, people within a church, and I've seen it in other churches I'm in, where they date and they go about it the wrong way and then they hurt each other and then they break up and it doesn't work out. And now one feels like they, they can't go to that church anymore because it's too embarrassing for them or they don't want to see that person anymore. And, and that can happen in any sort of relationship. It's not just dating, it's marriage, it's friendships, it's even business relationships too. You know, so that's why you have to be careful about how you go about relationships. And you've got to think about how is this relation? I've got to go about it in a way that's pleasing to God. And you know, it, what happens if it breaks, breaks up? You know? So yeah, that happens too. Either it's an employee and uh, employer, or maybe it's two people in a church decide to go into business together. And they just think like, oh, we're all both Christians. We can do this business together. No, you have to sometimes be more diligent about how you do business together with people that you have relationships you know, outside of business, which is in church as well, and how it's going to affect that. And oftentimes when you have a business deal go sour and it's somebody that's not in church, at least it won't affect your spiritual standing as well in terms of like how you uh, may relate at church. So broken relationships, that's a reason why people quit church. Not a good reason, but that is uh, one reason why people get out of church. Number two... Reasons why Christians quit church. Number two is wrong priorities. Wrong priorities. Now, how does wrong priorities manifest itself in our life? You know how it manifests itself? I'm too busy. That's how it manifests itself. So I'm too busy to go to church. I'm too busy. I've got too many things going on in my life. Now, everyone has 24 hours in the day. There's, there's enough things to do in this world to fill our schedule. Our schedules will always be full. So this is why it's, it's never a case of being too busy. It's always a case of just not having your priorities set right. Because when things are very important to you, you'll make the time to do them. And that's why when it comes to the things of God, oftentimes when people are too busy to do the things of God, it's just that it's not high enough in your priority list. There are things higher in your priority list than making sure the things that God expects of you are done in your life. Look what it says here in Luke 8. Uh, this is a, a verse from Jesus explaining the parable of the sower. So the parable of the sower, you remember there was few scenarios, seed that fell by the wayside, stony ground, and then on thorny ground, and then on good ground. So this is Jesus' explanation of the seed which fell on thorny ground, right? And the explanation is, you know, that seed is obviously the Word of God, the ground is our heart, and how our heart responds to the Word of God will either, you know, people, some people are not saved, some people are, you know, fall on stony ground, and then the thorny ground is what he's describing here, and why people are not as fruitful in their Christian life as they could be. Luke 8, 14, And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So it's a lot of cares in our world. These are like our responsibilities and concerns and things that we are you know, concerning ourselves with, those sort of cares. Obviously chasing riches, thinking of work and employment and people starting businesses and just working you know, six, seven days a week and not having enough time and energy to come to church. Or maybe it's just pleasures, just like holiday, too many holidays and just like always spending time enjoying this on the weekend and that on the weekend and going here and going there. Oh, the weather's good, so I'm going to go to the beach on Sunday. Because I couldn't go on Saturdays, so I'm going to go to the beach on Sunday and I'm not going to go to church. And then, you know, you get into the habit of skipping church and you have the wrong priorities and eventually you get out. 
So this comes in the form of, like I said, too busy. Work, pleasure, and even just fam obligations for family, friends, girlfriends, boyfriends, you know. I don't think Christians should do the whole boyfriend, girlfriend thing like the world does. You know, boyfriend, girlfriend thing is, uh, you don't just you know, pretend to be married when you're not married. That's pretty much what boyfriend and girlfriend is. Um, you know, I would just consider boyfriends and girlfriends just friends that are, you know, talking about whether or not they should get married. But what's interesting about these thorns, these thorns, they're like weeds, you know, weeds in a garden. And if uh, you're trying to grow some plants and your garden is just overcome with weeds, it chokes that word, right? Chokes that plant so that it can't grow and bring forth fruit. Now, I don't know about in your gardens, but in my gardens, there's weeds, you know, just going rampant sometimes. <laughs> you know, just going all over the place, right? I'm trying to take some tips from John and grow my grass to choke out the weeds, but I'm not winning that battle yet. <laughs> but just like weeds in a garden, you know, these other priorities in your life and just other obligations, they multiply as well. You know, just things you've got to go to, events you've got to go to. So, you know, that's why it's not about having not enough time or being too busy. It's about priorities. It's about setting limits. It's about being able to say no to things because, you know, there's always going to be that cousin's son's birthday to go to and that old friend who's getting married. And then, and then it just grows and grows and grows because as you get older, your network gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? People having more children, you have more, more nephews and nieces and second cousins and third cousins. And it just keeps going and you just going, keep going along to all these family events. And you know, I got to go, I got to keep face. Well, yeah, you can go to them, but you've got to set your priorities right, that you're not neglecting things you ought to be doing in your life, quitting church for the wrong priorities. Sometimes you've got to know what to say yes to and what to say no to. Right? So it's not about time. It's about having priorities, setting limits. And if you're not careful in your life, these riches, these cares, pleasures of this life, they will just grow and multiply and multiply and they'll just choke the word out of your life, right? God's word that says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You know, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, have you not read? You know, it is written, a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Like these are some things you need to know. Pray without ceasing. You know, these things in your life. And these things get choked out. Why? Because you're too busy. But why are you too busy? Because you're not prioritizing things right. You're not setting limits where limits need to be set. You're not saying, no, I'm not going to go to that thing on Sunday because I have other priorities that take precedence. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. You know, so often we give the best days of our life to something second rate to God. I mean, how many people, like, their blood, sweat, and tears go into, like, a business or into a career or into some passion, right? But the Bible says here in Ecclesiastes 12, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. See, we ought to give our best to God. We don't want to spend all our youth chasing our dreams, chasing everything that we want to do. And then when we're old and we don't have the energy to do those things anymore, we're like, okay, now it's time to serve God. Well, you're not going to have the same energy and mindset and passion that you would have had if you served God when you had your youth still with you. You know, but it's, it's never too late to serve God. But obviously we want to give God our best, not only of our resources, but of our time as well. And it's about priorities. Priorities. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So if people quit church because of broken relationships, people quit church because they have the wrong priorities, right? And you get out of church, you keep skipping church, you keep skipping church, it's easier to skip church, right? And then eventually you just get out of church. Right? You haven't built good relationships, nothing keeping you in church anymore. That's the reason why people get out of church. You've got to be aware of these things. 
Number three is worldly influences. Worldly influences. Now, there are some sins that we just make you not welcome at church. We're not talking about those, but we'll read here from 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5, these are not reasons why people quit church, but these are reasons why people are not welcome at church. Uh, Verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must he needs go out of the world. But now I've written unto you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. I remember once I was being interviewed, um, and uh, it was about same-sex marriage, and the, the guy was saying, oh, yeah, but shouldn't everyone be welcomed at church? And that's not true. You know, I know it sounds good. It sounds like everyone, and everyone, we want everyone in church. But there are certain sins that are not welcome at church because they're very detrimental to the body of Christ. So people have to get these things Right, they have to stop doing these things in order to join the body of Christ, right? And they continue in them. You know, obviously they, 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 they have an opportunity to, to get right with God, but if they continue and persist and are unrepentant about that sin, right? Getting rid of that sin in their life, then the Bible says, hey, these people, should, we should not keep company with them, right? Because the, the danger, because, you know, it's interesting in 1 Corinthians 5 how he talks about them being puffed up and thinking that they're so loving, but yet they are allowing this sin to sort of infest their church, right? So there are certain things, and I won't go through all the list there, but we just read through them there, that would make people unwelcome at church, and for good reason, right? So not everybody is welcome at church because there are certain sins that are, like I said, detrimental. It doesn't mean we can't be acquaintances with them and try and reach them and try and encourage them and get right and get back in church, get right with God, um, but they would not be allowed to fellowship with the body here. It says here in 1 Corinthians 5, Also, for what have I to do to judge them that are also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So, worldly influences worldly influences so those are some things where will make you unwelcome at church but look at what it says here in first john 2 love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the father the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world so when we talk about worldliness We're not just talking about things that are in the world. Because sometimes people say, are you against worldliness? But you use a computer. You know, you use the internet. Ah, like, why are you you using things that are in the world? Worldliness in the Bible is is defined as these things. The lusts of the flesh, right? So if you think about, like, you know, I guess drugs, things that just make you feel good but aren't necessarily good for you. Obviously, fornication would sit in that as well. The lusts of the eyes, that's like materialistic pornography, um, things that tempt the eyes for you to look at, right? And the pride of life. The pride of life is like your stature with man, you know, looking cool. Um, I mean, you don't have to look as too far. You just look at the Hollywood actors, the, the musicians these days, a lot of the sports stars, and they just define this very thing, right? Worldliness the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And unfortunately, because they are generally what a lot of people are watching these days, you know, you're watching the movie stars and the, uh, the singers and the sports stars, everyone starts acting like them, starts dressing like them. You know, they're dressing, the girls are dressing like with no clothes on these days. The men are starting to wear, like, you know, have all these fancy haircuts like girls and then wearing, like, the skinny jeans and all this rubbish like this, you know, dyeing their hair. They're starting to look like these things. Hopefully, hopefully you, you copy, you know, like, some of the more Western American singers and you're not, like, copying. Because when I look in, like, say, Asian culture, some of the pop stars, like, literally have hair that is, like, straighter and more flowing than girls have it. It's disgusting. Seriously. But this is what people are looking at these days. And then, you know, because they're looking at them, you know, a lot of our friends from outside of church, that's what they're like. And that's how they talk. And if you spend too much time around these bad influences, it starts rubbing off on you. 
And look at what the Bible says. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So you see how it's all polar opposites, the love of the world and the love of the Father. And that's why the more you spend time with these worldly and these bad influences, whether it's friends or family or just the things you do for pleasure, and the more love of the world that grows in you, the less of the love of the Father is in you. And it just slowly diminishes until people eventually quit church. You know, I've heard so many people, you know, they talk about um, their friends and the sort of people they hang around with. And I warn people, like, just be careful the sort of people you hang around and the influence you have on them. And sometimes I'll get a response like, oh, but my friends are not that bad, you know? They're not like, you know, druggies and everything like that or you know, doing all that sort of stuff. But then, it, then I think, yeah, but are your friends encouraging you to go to church? Or are they encouraging you to get out of church? Are they encouraging you to talk about the Bible? Are they encouraging you to get involved in soul winning? Do they encourage you in prayer? Do they pray for you? Do you pray for them? Are they encouraging you to pray more? This is what I mean by good friends. I don't just mean friends that aren't murderers and rapists. You know, we're talking about worldly friends. Friends that the more you hang around, the more worldly you're getting. Those are the sort of friends that, yeah, maybe they're there for you and they, they've done some good things. I'm not saying they've never done anything good for you. I'm just saying, like, but are they the sort of people that you just want to be hanging around all the time, your closest, close-knit friends that are having this influence on you and dragging you down because those sort of things can drag you down spiritually and eventually people quit church. And you know, it might be, you know, these sort of things could be, could be laziness as well. You know, it just doesn't, if you're already struggling to, to overcome laziness and doing things for God, you know, friends that are not encouraging you to do the right thing, it's not making it any easier either. So we want to beware of these sorts of friends outside. I'm not saying that you just cut them off completely, right? You still want to be able to have an influence in their lives. But it's the, it's the, the, the amount, it's the balance, right? If it's overbalanced, too much balance on that side, it's going to pull you in the wrong direction. Now, just like we don't want those sort of friends outside of church, we don't want to be that kind of friend in church either. So think about the sort of friend you are in church. Are you the sort of friend that is encouraging people to go soul winning? You know, are you, are you encouraging them to read their Bible? Are you, in, are you that sort of friend? We want to be that sort of friend in church as well. Now, eventually, you know, when people just become more and more worldly and they start backsliding, they get out of church because, you know, nobody wants to live a two-faced life. You know, you can only last so long coming to church pretending that you've got it all together, but really you don't give two hoots about God outside of church. You, know, you don't want to be like a modern-day Pharisee where you come to church and you pretend to be spiritual, you pretend to care about the things of God, but in your life you don't care. You know? And you, you know, sometimes people, like, you know, the, the way they dress and they act, it's like that at church, but then when they're, when they're at their workplace, it all goes to, to nothing. You know, and you're swearing at work and you're joking about the wrong thing and you go out with your work colleagues and you're dressed in like the mini skirts and all, you know, all the stuff. You want to be the same as you are outside as you are in church because eventually it, it, you won't be able to just keep it up and that's why people eventually quit. Look at what Jesus says about the Pharisees here. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. See, that's what Jesus had to say about the Pharisees. But, you know, a lot of Christians, unfortunately, live this sort of life. And you don't want to live this sort of life. It's only going to last for so long. And that's why people that are like this, they eventually get out. You know, you don't want to be half in, half out with church because usually you fall out. So that's why. What's the solution? You don't want to be like, you want to do the right thing, you know, so that you don't quit church. 
Look at what Jesus says about uh, the church in Sardis in Revelation 3.1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. You know, and whenever I read that, that reminds me as well of the person that says they're a Christian but then has nothing to show for it in their Christian life. Does that mean you're not saved? No, no, that has nothing to do with salvation. But you have a name that you live. You call yourself a Christian. But do you have any works to add to that faith? Right? We want to add works. We don't want to have a dead faith. You know, it doesn't mean we're not saved, but we want a living faith. We want a faith you know, that brings forth fruit unto God. All right, number four, number four reason why people quit church is they lose interest, right? They just lose interest. It's not fun anymore. You know, things are always exciting when they're new, but you just need to realize this in life and grow up a bit that not everything in life has to be exciting. Right? Not everything in life has to be fun. Not everything that is worth doing is always easy. And you know, if you have that sort of self-serving attitude, that's the sort of attitude people will have when everything has to be fun. It has to entertain them. It has to tickle their fancy because it's all about what it does for them. Right? But you need to change your... You need to grow to a point where church is no longer about what it does for you. You don't see church as a place where you come to get something. Now, will you get something if you come to church? You will. But you need to grow to the point where you come to church and see it as an opportunity to do something for God. Right? Church is here for you to serve. It's not just here for you to be served. Right? We want to make servants of God, not just fans of God that just come and just need to get their, you know, their, their ears tickled right? and get a pat on the back. Sometimes you need to kick up the bum, you know, to get going. And church is a place where that happens. So you want to get to the point where, like I said, you come with a mindset where church is an opportunity for me to get involved in the work of God, to be a blessing to others. And that's where it gets a lot more interesting because it gives you some purpose for being here. This is the same with Jesus Christ. Look at what it says here in Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So when you talk about, when you think about, okay, well, church isn't fun anymore, maybe have the mindset of, well, how can you make it more fun? You know, I mean, I could always use some help organizing events. You know, I mean, those are boys who went go-karting. Yeah, that was pretty fun, right? So, these, so sometimes things can be fun as we do things together. But if you have the mindset of how can I make it more fun rather than just thinking, hey, it's not fun anymore. Well, how can we make things more fun, more interesting? How, what can you do about it to make it more interesting for others? You know, can you be a better friend to others and be more friendly to others? Uh, so you want to have this serving mindset. What about the sermons? People say, well, the sermons are getting boring. Yeah, well, eventually if you come long enough, you're going to hear the same things again and again and again and again because I'm teaching the Bible, right? Sometimes it gets to the point where, you know, you, you, maybe you know everything I'm going to teach. You know, you know all the verses I'm going to go to. You know the things that you need to know. And I'm just reminding you again and again and again. Well, maybe it's time that you started teaching. Maybe it's time that you started preaching. If you know it all, then teach the body. And it may not necessarily be in a public forum like this, but learn some things so that you can help somebody else, right? And teach them the Bible. Learn how to go soul winning. Learn how to preach the gospel. Learn how to explain it. Learn how to lead somebody to Jesus Christ and learn how to take somebody along with you and explain to them what you're doing and how you're explaining things. Become a teacher. Hebrews 5, verse 12, look at what it says here. For when for the time he ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. 
For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know, this is why soul winning is so important. You know why? Because you will eventually get bored coming every week and staring at the same faces. It'll happen, right? Because that's not what church is meant to be about. Church is not just meant to be about going there, having something to eat, and just socializing for an hour or two and then leaving because eventually it gets boring talking to the same people again and again and again and again, right? Because that's not what it's about. But if you start serving together, if you start having a different purpose to actually go out and preach the gospel, you know what doesn't get boring? Talking to different people all the time, right? Different people out there, you know, talking to them and explaining the gospel to them. This is why it's so important for you to get involved in the work. And you know what? People that don't get involved in some sort of work in church eventually end up quitting. Right, because it's 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 not that interesting, you know, like just talking with the same people all the time. Because eventually you know one another. I remember, you know, and, and when I was going to a church in the states, like I spent so much time with the guys there, because we'd we'd hang out all the time. We even like room together, and sometimes we just sit there and have nothing to talk about, because we talked about everything, we talked about all the political stuff, all the controversial doctrine, and we we talked about it until we're blue in the face. And sometimes we just sit there. We were like. I remember we used to go to this place called Oregano's. Well, that's how they pronounce it. We would pronounce it Oregano's. They pronounce it Oregano's. And we literally just be sitting there and just like have nothing to talk about because, you know, so what did we do? We went soul winning together. We did a lot of soul winning together as, uh, as single guys. So this is why it's important because this is what will keep it interesting. This is actually what keeps, you know, Christianity interesting. Right, is when you actually serve, you actually have a purpose and actually are doing things. Right? You're a doer of the work, not just a hearer. All right, number five. Another reason why uh, people quit church. Persecution. Persecution. You know, maybe you're made fun of for going to church. Maybe you know, you're making changes in your life and the friends you used to hang out with are going, you know, oh, Mr. Holy, Holy, Holy. You know, you'll get that as a Christian. You know, just expect it. It's a... Uh, have it as a, hold it as a badge of honor that people are making fun of you trying to live a more righteous life than you otherwise would. You know, maybe you'll get disapproval from family and friends, you know, especially maybe from people from other religion backgrounds. You know, you change your religion. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and your family is not so happy with you anymore and they may make comments here and there. But, you know, none of us really experience a lot of the things that those in the Bible have experienced in terms of persecution. So I think in terms of that, we can find comfort in the fact that we really don't have it that bad. But unfortunately, some people, they can't take that. You know, they, they don't endure through that persecution and they get out of church. Right? They don't like what people are saying about it. Uh, look at what Daniel did in uh, Daniel 6, uh, verse 7. When, um, when we think about persecution... We not only have just people making fun of us or people maybe not wanting to associate us, but what happens when going to church is illegal, right? All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the councillors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions." Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the, the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. You know, as um, a lot of these coronavirus restrictions were on, we were meeting in the house. But a lot of people didn't want to come along, even though we were having church in the house. So this is the reason. Well, what happens when church is no longer allowed at all in some countries? Are people just going to quit church completely? Some people do, unfortunately. Some people don't 
take on that persecution as God has called us to do. 2 Timothy 3. Look at what Paul says here. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Look at this. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So what's the solution here? The solution here is just to change your mindset. You know, some people don't expect to go through hard times as a Christian. They think the Christian life is easy. It's not. You know, the Christian life is not always easy. And as governments crack down on the truth, it gets harder and harder to live and believe the truth. But we just need to know that persecution will arise if we try and live a godly life for Christ Jesus. But what should be our attitude? Look at what Jesus says in Luke 6, verse 22. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and men shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Not so easy to do, but you can see... Um, you know, how Jesus is uh, telling us to respond uh, when it comes to persecution. But, you know, I've known people in my life where, you know, they were going to church and they were getting made fun of or, you know, they didn't like the stigma that they were getting from their family and then they quit church, you know, and they, they didn't want to go to the Catholic church or the Orthodox church, so they just got out of church completely. And is that a good reason to get out of church? Of course not, but... You know, unfortunately, it happens. It shouldn't, but it does. Don't let it happen to you. And number six, number six, a reason why people quit church is false doctrines. Maybe it's doctrines, maybe it's better phrases, doctrines that they don't agree with, right? Either, way, either it's false, even it is actually false, or they just don't agree with some of the things that are being taught. Now, obviously, we need to differentiate between salvational issues and non-salvational issues. Right? Salvational issues are things that affect salvation. Because people can preach another gospel, another Jesus, another you know, thing that actually affects salvation, and those are the things we should not bear with. Right? If somebody's in a church and they're in a church that's preaching a false gospel, they shouldn't even go to that church to begin with. That's not necessarily quitting church. You shouldn't even be at that church to begin with. 2 Corinthians 11, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might, bear, ye might well bear with him. Right? So, Paul here is saying he doesn't want us to bear with this false prophet. You need to get them out or get, you know, get them out of the influence in your life. So we need to differentiate between salvational and non-salvational issues, right? So for example, work salvation is a salvational issue. If somebody's teaching that you need to have works in order to be saved, that's a heresy, that's a salvational issue. Or somebody believes you can lose your salvation, that's also a salvational issue, right? Because if you believe you lose your salvation, then, you know, did Jesus not die for all your sins? But a non-salvational issue might be like end times prophecy, for example. End times prophecy, uh, other examples of, say, say, convictions might be clothing standards. Some people quit church because of the clothing standards in church. They believe all women, you know, can't wear pants. You know, they have to wear skirts all the time. Or maybe, um, you know, positions on alcohol. You know, like, I don't believe it's a sin to drink alcohol. I don't recommend it. But I don't think it's necessarily a sin. Some people don't like that position. And sometimes they leave church because of it. Um, maybe positions on holidays. Some people are so against, like, celebrating Christmas and Easter. And they think it's all pagan. Shouldn't have anything to do with it. That they quit church. Right? Now, are these reasons to quit church? No. They might be reasons to move to another church. But unfortunately, that's not always the case with Christians. You know, they make it so disenfranchised with something that is taught at one church that they just get out of church completely, right? They just make the excuse and just say, oh, I can't find a church that believes exactly like I do. So they just don't go to any church. 
That's not a good reason to quit church. Now, if somebody's going to change churches because of a personal conviction or because of a belief that they hold to, you need to know where you're going before you leave a church, right? Because you need to be in church because it's going to be more beneficial for you to be in church and have an opportunity to serve and have the accountability and have people to talk to and associate with, right, and serve with than it is to just be out of church completely, even though you may have a difference. So if somebody does switch churches for those reasons, they should know where they're going before they leave that church. So in conclusion, these are reasons and bad reasons for people to quit church, right? Broken relationships. This is why it's very important for us to have strong relationships and, and to work on and grow in our conflict resolution, in our ability not to be offended, in our ability to try not to offend others and to be a good friend to others. It's very important. Wrong priorities. Remember, this manifests as being too busy, but it's not about being too busy. It's about having you know, not the, the right priorities and not setting limits. Bad influences. You know, if you hang around with worldly friends, you're just worldly all the time, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh and the pride of life, eventually, you know, you don't want to be a hypocrite anymore. Eventually, the love of the Father is not in you and people quit. So you've got to be aware of these. People that lose interest, or lost interest, right? If you want Christianity to be more interesting, then you've got to get serving, right? Christianity wasn't meant to be just a serve, serve you all the time. What gets more interesting is when you start taking part in the work and when you start actually making a difference in people's lives. Man, that is extremely fulfilling and gives you a lot of purpose and that's how god wants it to be persecution just expect it it's coming it will happen you know your family may not like you as much as they do for doing what's right you know your friends may not be as friendly with you but do what's right by god you know first and foremost right don't quit on god and then you have doctrines and convictions and like i said this is probably the only reason why somebody should consider changing churches uh, this is never a good reason to quit church. Uh, you need to be in church. It's so important to our spiritual life. So we'll read Hebrews 10 and we'll finish here. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So beware of these things in your life. If you start to see these things creeping in, you've got to do something about it. And always remember, you know, when you don't feel like going to church, that's when you need church the most. You know, come to church, stay under the preaching, stay amongst God's people, because if you don't, it's only downhill from there. All right? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for your love and grace. We thank you that, Lord, we're not perfect in our lives. And uh, even though we're not perfect, you're still there for us like the prodigal son and the father. We thank you, Lord, so much for your love and your grace. We don't deserve it. And I pray, Lord, that your love will constrain us to go on and do greater things for you, Lord. Help us to love, help us to grow, help us to become teachers, not just spectators. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.